Hello and welcome back to Cinematic Universe everyone. My name is Ernesto Martinez and joining me for the second time, the animation guru, David Powers King. How are you, man? I'm well, and how are you? Banana. <laughs> Banana. La papaya, tu tapela. I, lo <laughs> I love their gibberish. It's like a combination of English, French, and Spanish. I think that's uh, deliberate, actually. I don't know. I, I'm pretty. I know it's deliberate, <laughs> but I also like the appeal that the one of the it gives it a bilingual uh, attractiveness to it. You know. Yeah, I was very worried for this movie, and the reason why I say that is because the reason why the minions work so well is because they're working off of Gru. Everything Gru did, the minions build off of that, and that's why they became one of the greatest backup characters ever created in live action or animation form. They're like, they're like, uh, you have the three aliens, the three toy aliens from Toy Story, and the minions are like right up here. <laughs> so That's a high bar. <laughs> it's a high bar because, I mean, those guys are cute and they were awesome, but they weren't used on the level the minions are. I mean... That's just the way it is, so it's a pretty high regard for the minions, I mean. You saw the box office numbers for the weekend. Those guys were killing it. Exactly. I mean, yeah, I was checking out those box office numbers, um, and I'm, what can I say? I'm extremely impressed. I mean, it, it, hasn't, it hasn't been out for that long, and already it's, uh, it's uh, surpassed inside out globally. Yeah, I was afraid that without Gru, the movie wasn't going to be, you know, as entertaining. I was entertained, but not like I was with the Despicable Me movies. It was serviceable. It, and it was very, it was a good sat satisfactory experience uh, at the movie theaters. There was like 50% that I laughed out loud, and the other 50% were just very pretty colors and a few jokes that just felt flat. But overall, I mean that it was a uh, it was enjoyable. The only negative, the only really big negative, and it's not even about the movie, is where I had to sit in the movie theater. I went to the first showing, and at the first showing, the theater was packed to the gills with children and parents and I didn't was not able to sit back here I had to sit in the front row oh yeah so you had to look up and crank your neck right well not not so much because I sat at the back part so I okay. didn't have to I just had to like move a little bit to the back so but, you weren't in the very front row then. no but I was in around there okay but the problem was that I was sitting in the middle right and for some reason, maybe somebody was playing a joke on me, or maybe it was a twist of irony. But th f four kids were sitting in my row, at least one seat apart from their parents, and they were special needs kids. So there were noises that shouldn't have been m being made were made, and moments that they shouldn't be laughing, they were laughing. I mean, it didn't ruin the experience, but it was like, oh my god, please, somebody control these kids. It's, I know it's, it sounds horrible, but it's like, ah, oh, come on, why? Why now? <laughs> well, actually, with my viewing, I had a similar experience. Uh, I took my son to it, and, I mean, he's old enough now that he enjoys films and everything, but we had a, you know, I mean, the uh, thing about this, uh, about this film is that it has taken huge appeal to the young audiences. Young kids absolutely adore these little yellow guys. Probably the most enjoyable, the most loved little yellow guys since SpongeBob. <laughs> you yeah. know? Uh, and because there's more than one of them, there's like hundreds of them. So there's more to love. And yeah. I mean, seriously, you go online and you can find all sorts of little minion crafts and kids are having birthdays with minion cakes because the pyrex <laughs> pan is the perfect size for kevin you know <laughs> and um and so of course you know parents are going to flock to this thing with the young kids and so if you're going to go see this show expect there to be kids i know that when i went to my showing there was a 
family who had a child and he cried the first half hour of the film. Mm. And then the parents just let the kid, let the little toddler kid just walk around the theater. <laughs> yeah, that's... And I'm just like, seriously. well, he stopped crying after that point, but still I'm like, should he really be walking around by himself in the dark? I don't know. Yeah, these are so, there's that. Those, those are the, those are the parents that I imagine they swear that when they go to the movie theater they think they're in their living room. But aside from that, um, I didn't really know what to expect from this film other than it's a spin-off mm -hmm. of Despicable Me. And I at the very first moment when I heard that they were going to make this movie, my first thought was I wonder how they are going to approach this cuz like you said earlier The minions play off of Gru awesomely. So what happens if you take Gru out of the equation? Can the minions stand up on their own? And when the first trailers came up, I was like, okay, they're going to do kind of a prequel thing, kind of an origin story for the minions and where they came from. And I was like, oh, I'm curious to see how that pans out. And then when the film begins, uh, we kind of go through this timeline of events, which... I thought was really clever. Yes, it was. I was very <laughs> curious about it. <laughs> it left me with a lot of questions too, but still, and and the soundtrack is was awesome. I liked all of the songs that they picked for their um, very much out of the eight sixties. It was very groovy, mm -hmm. and I was just you know jamming along throughout the whole movie. <laughs> yeah. So they did a great job with the song selection and really putting us in nineteen sixty eight. Before and, Gru. <laughs> huh? 42 years before Gru. <laughs> before Gru. Which really gives you kind of an idea of how old Gru is. He's in his late 50s at least. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> which, he looks great for his age. Yeah. I mean, he looks great. Um, I always assumed the Minions were aliens from another planet and they crash landed and they met with Gru. Or maybe he, it was either that or they were a science experiment gone wrong. And he That's just, what I thought. And he just multiplied them. But no, they are giant size, banana color, plankton. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> That's what they are. They're plankton, yep. but yellow. <laughs> and not as smart as the plankton. <laughs> and they came out of the sea. And evolved like everything else did. Well, to an extent. To an extent. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, I liked uh, the narration, like, leading... Because we saw this in the trailer. You saw all the bosses that they had. And, like, they went to the most evil boss they could find. From a T-Rex to a caveman to Dracula. They cut a few of them. Like, the trailer had one where they were, like, what? A king in a castle. They didn't include that in the movie. I did love the Napoleon part. <laughs> that was that was very cute. So the basic and the Dracula bit. Even though I saw it in the trailer before, I still was cracking up in the theater. It was great. Yeah, it's like oh well, all right, there goes Dracula. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's what fuels the minions. That what that's what keeps them, in a sense, alive. Because these guys are basically immortal. I mean, n almost nothing can can affect these guys in any way, shape, or form. So it's like, these guys ha are basically immortal. And the only thing that powers their immortality is working for the biggest, baddest person in the world. And when they're not working for the biggest, baddest person in the world, they just slump around and they'll probably wither away and die if they don't work for anybody. So I'm like, well, at least they have a purpose in life. They're workers. <laughs> But, and yet they are still able to obtain bananas in the Arctic. And I would love to know how they accomplish that. <laughs> I did not realize that until you said it. <laughs> but yeah, it's... Kind of a plot hole. And yet it's one of those things where it's like... It's the minions. It's the minions. They can get away with There's it. no logic to them at all. <laughs> but yeah... I, I'm going to say this. I thought Scarlet Overkill was going to be Gru's mom. Oh. I don't know why. I was so... I'm like, maybe she's Gru's mom. And it's kind of like a passing of the torch. The trailers didn't give off that it was going to be like that. But I'm like, well, she's supposed to be the baddest, baddest in the world. 
So after her comes Gru. So you have to wonder, oh, well, maybe she's his mom. Who knows? I mean, she has the nose for it, so <laughs> could have been, but it wasn't. <laughs> uh, what do you think of uh, Scarlet Overkill? I thought that she, uh, uh, she was one of my three favorite things about the film. Oh, okay. I think Sandra Bullock did a very great job with her, and I would love to see some footage of her being filmed when she's doing The Voice, because I... I because, you know, usually people are pretty animated looking when they're trying to get these voices out. And Sandra Bullock did just an amazing job with her. And I'd love to see some of that action when she's speaking. Yeah. And, uh, and just an overall fun character. Um, the, she has a husband in the movie and he's voiced by John Hamm. Equally fun, I might add. Oh, he was fun, but the design of the character... For some reason, I kept thinking, this could have been a great opportunity to get Nicolas Cage to play this character. <laughs> it would have been perfect. I'm not saying that John Hamm didn't do a good job. He did. I'm just saying this would have been perfect for Nicolas Cage. Just now that the, you say it, it kind of looked like him a little bit. Yeah, just the mannerisms, just the lack of, uh, uh, <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> it's like, that was Nicolas Cage worthy. I love Villain Khan. That was brilliant. Very brilliant. Just the moment you see the minions start to, like, what prompts them to get to VillainCon, to meeting Scarlet Overkill at VillainCon. That entire sequence had to be one of my favorite moments, because it's just, it's, it's, it, there were, there are no expectations. You just along for the ride, and you're hoping, you don't know where this is going to go, and but you're hoping it's going to be entertaining, and it was. So, yeah, that was, uh, yeah, it was, it was what it was, very entertaining. This movie has a lot of, uh... A lot of randomness to it. Oh, yeah, but this movie... And I'm, uh, I mean, I'm a big fan of random, love it. And, uh, yeah, well, I mean, I enjoyed the, uh, the villain con as well. And probably... The hardest I laughed throughout the entire film was uh, whenever the villain family was around. <laughs> whenever they had any scenes of, you know, the mother and father and the two kids, and they pick up the minions when they're hitchhiking, they're on their way to Villain Con, and, oh, by the way, uh, we're going to rob a bank, <laughs> just on the spur of the moment. <laughs> <laughs> just because they can. And I just loved it. it, it it just kind of made it was making fun of it, like because the whole point of the film is these minions are serving villainy, and they're making fun of being bad. Yeah, so it's a parody of itself. Yeah, did you notice that this movie like it hit it well in its uh, humor, but this was a very violent movie. <laughs> I mean, look at the trailer. You see the the. The king, the knight, getting stabbed by his own sword, like literally getting stabbed. You see Dracula die, turning to dust. You see a T Rex dying, molten lava. You basically have a a guy who is basically based as from Albert Einstein break his neck, <laughs> and then all his other creations are gone. It's like this movie is very violent. Shit. <laughs> And most of that's within the, within the first three minutes. Exactly. So it's just like, wow, they really got away with it. I mean, maybe it's because it's an animated movie and it's played for laughs. But it's like, there is a lot of death in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> Not to say that there hasn't been death in animated movies. There are. They're probably what makes them amazing. But this one specifically, I'm like... The collateral in this movie is off the chains. I just want to point that out. <laughs> Probably my least favorite part was through the end where Kevin was it? He had to save everybody else. That the whole sequence with uh, him, you know, getting big and all that stuff. It's like, ah, you had to go there, didn't you? But it, giant yellow marshmallow man. Giant yellow marshmallow man. I'm just like, eh. That entire part I could have done without it. I feel like that was unnecessary. They, they, they were going on a good way. They just had to crank it up a little bit in those last five minutes. But, yeah, overall, very enjoyable. 
I never felt bored, even when the jokes felt flat. I'm surprised they even gave that much uh, screen time to the Queen of England. <laughs> they, yeah, and what, what was the last thing I was going to say? Um, oh, yeah. I don't know why, but they asked the, one, of the, or one of the creators of the Minions what the gender was. What, what, what their gender was, and for some reason he had to explain, oh, there are definitely men. Then None of them are going to, like, there was like a lack of women in the Minions. I always assumed that the Minions were genderless, and they were just the way they are, because there was no, uh, there was no barometer to any sexual orientation to them, based on their mannerisms in the first two Despicable movies. So I'm like, they're just Minions. That you don't have to classify them as genders. But then he comes out saying, oh, they're boys, because there's no way I could ever create a character that stupid and call it a woman. I'm like, oh, why would you say that? It's like, it's one of those moments where it's like, there's a secret to something. Don't tell anybody what that secret is. Because once you tell it, it's going to lose its magic. So coming out and officially, and I say that with quotation marks, officially saying that the minions are boys, it's like, why would you do that? You kind of take away the magic of them. They're nothing. They're just minions. It's like Plankton. Plankton have no sex. <laughs> well, that's pretty much it. Did you yeah. have any when, low moments? When you ex yeah, when you do explain some things in the realm of storytelling, you do remove that element of magic to it. And there are some things that, you know... Some things in films and, and stories that I hope I never know the answers to because that's why I'm intrigued by it. But, you know, um, for me, uh, I guess that if I'm going to have any issue with it at all is I feel that the film itself, the, min the film Minions, kind of did a disservice to the whole Despicable Me world universe thing. And this is kind of why. And this is me putting on my uh, dissecting gloves. <laughs> is because the thing that drives the minions into doing what they do is they have to serve whoever the biggest, baddest villain is. Mm. And that is how they operate through the whole course of time. They have evolved over thousands of years to do this, which is fine and good. And then we have them serving Gru and all that. But the thing is, as we, if you've uh, if, you know been following along with the Despicable Me movies, we um, Gru no longer becomes evil, or he's not full on, full fledged evil. And, and you know, in the second film, he's definitely not the biggest, baddest in the world. And yet, the minions are still loyal to Gru. Yeah, they're they, they're not going anywhere. And uh, so, while creating a backstory for the minions and where they came from, they went against the grind for what was already previously established, and it kind of just doesn't work anymore. Unless, if they do a Despicable Me 3, and they have the minions decide to be bored with Gru and move on, then fine, they can redeem themselves that way. But until then, That's gonna be it's kind of a big hole that just got dug that I didn't see needed to be done. It's like, let's put in a pool and then they dig the hole and then they never do anything with it. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's going to be depressing seeing the opening act to the Despicable, Despicable Me 3. Yeah, they're bored with you, man. They want to find somebody else. You know whose heart's <laughs> going to get broken? The little three, the three girls. <laughs> Although by that point, the two of them will probably be teenagers and one of them will probably be entering her tween years. That'll be Although really, if that's like what's the beginning problem of the third film, then it might actually work. That's actually not a bad way to start a conflict oh, yeah. for a third one if they want to go that way. Yeah. And you know they're going to do a Despicable Me three because the, the second one was fifty million dollars shy of making a billion worldwide, and that was insane. I that is one of those movies where I never expected it to reach those kinds of numbers. I'm like, really? I mean, I had it's like what? <laughs> kind of, kind of that, that reaction. It's like what? Um, I 
think the reason why the minion popularity was is as big as like cementing it as big as it was is because to this day you see the minions everywhere. For the better part of a year, even between the second movie and before this one, every time I went to the movie theater and they gave you the whole commercial like please turn off your cell phones and don't make any noises. Who was on the big screen? The Minions. They're just walking around. Yeah, I agree. I mean, not just in the theaters, but uh, one thing that they that Minions definitely had going for itself was the marketing campaign. Mm. It was out of this world. You walk in the mall and you see the Minions are affiliated with this store, and you're like, that's kind of a weird place to see the Minions. But they really are everywhere. And I've never seen an animated film advertised in such a wide breadth before yeah. as this. And I think that certainly helped contribute to the global box office we're seeing it have right now. Yep. And, hell, when I was at work, there was a Twinkie left in my, in my desk. And guess what kind of Twinkie it was? A minion-shaped Twinkie. Of course. <laughs> They're hilarious and delicious. Which, could you imagine? I mean, that's the most genius marketing right there, a Twinkie. And just a few years ago, Twinkies almost went extinct until somebody brought them back. So it's just like, damn, that would have been a blow to the marketing. I mean, not too much of a blow, but it's like a missed opportunity. Yeah, overall, this movie is what it is. It's the Minions. If you love the Minions, you're going to love the movie. There are many moments where they'll make you laugh, and there are a few moments where the jokes will just fall flat. But even if the jokes fall flat for you... It's mo it'll mostly make the kids laugh. So, at any given also, moment in this movie, somebody's going to be laughing. Yeah, and the, there's also quite a few jokes in there for the grown-ups as well. And uh, quite a few, in fact, that are going to fly over the kids' heads. Oh, yes, they are. <laughs> I'm just saying, they are. <laughs> but yeah, um, overall, I, uh, I don't know where to put it, because... I mean, it wasn't the greatest thing, but it's also it was also funny, so it's kind of in the middle. I'll probably put it at between 3.5 and 4. That's where I'll put wow. it. And the, I'm going to say, um, I mean, it was enjoyable, but, I mean, I went in with no expectations. I, w I went in with uh, hoping that I would be at least mildly amused. And... Um, as much as I love the Minions, I think that the Minions are great. I just don't think that the story that they were used for served them in the best way possible. And for for most of the time, I was uh, watching the film, waiting for it to escalate, and it never quite got beyond that humor that it had in the first 20 minutes of the film or so, and it just kind of fizzled near the end, and then by the time... The ending with the giant celebration ceremony with the queen at the end, I was just like, I'm ready for this to be done. <laughs> and then it ended with, and then it ended with, a, oh, this is cool, because it kind of ties into the future films, or the films that are supposed to come after this, and I enjoyed the way that it ended. As far as, I mean, it's enjoyable, I, it's, uh, I, I mean, I recommend it with your young kids if you enjoy it. For me, the uh, rewatchability isn't really that amazing, in my opinion, and I'm probably going to... Uh, this is hard for me to do. This isn't the Minions' fault. This is just... I, I, I just wasn't in love with the story quite so much, and so I'm going to have to give it a sorry. Okay. Um, well, everyone, thanks for joining us. Thanks for listening. You can find me at MartinexXYZ on Twitter. You can find me on YouTube, Cinematic Universe Ultimate. And you can find me at Movie Pilot, Cinematic Universe Heir to the Celluloid. David, where can they find you? You can find me on Twitter. Twitter handle is David Powers King, and I also have a website at DavidPowersKing.com, right, which everyone. I seriously need to update. <laughs> bye bye, guys. <laughs>